Well, I think the biggest problem uh, studying the social environment and social determinants of health really is, is the, the, the damage which is produced by the current economy, clearly. I think we need to move toward an economy which is not fixed exclusively or primarily on individual profit, on individual profit maximization, but which uh, looks for some fair, fair distribution and for some solidarity between the employers and employees. And uh, so I think we need really rethinking the destructive components of the capitalist development. That's actually what I consider a major problem. I would like to see um, uh, every person have um, a well-developed social safety net that will take care of them when, uh, when technological change develops and they lose their skills, when um, jobs get moved overseas. Um, these are all disruptive kinds of things and people cannot be left to their own devices in the market. Uh, so w in my lifetime, in the past 40 years, what we've seen is a huge growth in um, the role of, 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 of thinking that emphasizes the market as the source of uh, decision making and, uh, and efficiency. Uh, as a result, people are left to their own devices to deal with themselves and their families. Some people have done quite well, but other people have not done well and they've fallen by the wayside. And I would love to see, uh, for example, in the United States, I would love to see uh, a well-developed so, uh, health insurance uh, system, uh, which we're moving toward now. I'd like to see um, uh, more secure retirement benefits. Uh, and this is also true in Europe, uh, and certainly in the uh, developing world, uh, in Africa, uh, in, uh, in, South in some countries in South America, uh, you have this issue in China, for example, you've got this issue as well, as they move to a market economy, there are more and more people being left behind. So a more of a um, uh, global sense of collectivity that enables people to have more protections from the the changes that are going to occur because you're not going to slow technological change, you're not going to slow globalization. What you can do is to provide people with some uh, protection against the risks that are going to be uh, inherent in these kinds of changes. I come from a part of the world where um, it, it's more egalitarian than uh, elsewhere. I come from Scandinavian countries with, with the Scandinavian experience on inequality and welfare states and uh, strong unions, high taxation. Uh, and to many, uh, say in the US, uh, the experience we have in, in Northern Europe, that is something that shouldn't happen because uh, we have policies and institutions they believe that will lead to a macroeconomic catastrophe. But what we have actually had is, is much higher economic growth, much more participatory development that give uh, the fruits of economic growth to a wide uh, majority of the population. And where income differentials are much smaller, inequality is much lower, and uh, where there sort of is a more a shared prosperity in the whole uh, uh, populations of these small open economies. And I think that some of these experiences that are, is valuable also for developing countries or other more advanced countries as well, uh, doesn't mean that one should imitate uh, anything from Scandinavia, but one can learn for the good and the bad of the experience that, that we have and we try to sum sum up these experiences uh, in a sensible manner for other countries to learn from. I would say my theory, my preferred theory of justice uh, at this point is that uh, the first goal is to equalize opportunities for people, which means, as I've said, to have an educational system and social policies which compensate people who are born with fewer resources, either, either through their genetics or through their families that they're born into, so that they have the same chances as other people of leading decent lives. And one first approximation for leading a decent life is facing the same possible distribution of income. 
However, that's not sufficient uh, because uh, notice I said that there'll be distributions of income and that's because people make different choices and even if opportunities are equalized, some people will decide to go into professions which uh, earn more money and other people professions which earn less money, especially if one has a, a market system, which is, as, you, as I've noted, I think is absolutely necessary in a complex economy. So the second question is then, how much inequality should be allowed, or how much inequality is, is, uh, is acceptable uh, in a decent society? And I think the level of inequality has to be quite limited. I think that if we develop huge inequalities, there's no way that people can be uh, equal. That they, I mean, a, a rich person can't consider a poor person to be his, his co-citizen with uh, equal value uh, uh, if the difference in their incomes is sufficiently large. So I think societies have to also limit the extent of income inequality. Uh, our aim is to first uh, identify and analyze major trends, challenges, changes affecting uh, people's working lives, then and suggest possible solutions to pressing problems such as inequality in areas of work and employment. Um, this chapter therefore provokes the inline research in forms of policy and uh, policy making. Uh, and set the direction for business management practice.